Hi, my name is Ken, and I'm going to be walking through the receiving of raw milk here. And so I'm going to be walking through a series of tests, and we're going to be following section five that's available to you. So specifically for this section that we're doing here, it is going to be lab station number three, which is raw milk quality receiving. So we're going to walk through a number of different tests here, looking at aroma, pH, and titratable acidity. These are tests that can be done when the raw milk is received to make sure that it has a good quality suitable for further processing. So the first thing when the tankers are received is we want to make sure that we check the temperature. So typically the product will be in a world pack bag and thermometers that we know are accurate and are certifiable uh, we know the temperatures precise are going to be utilized to simply take the temperature of the milk. Now, we'd like to have all the milk received be less than 4 degrees Celsius, and so these are going to be the things that can be recorded on documentation within your plant. In addition, we're going to be doing a few simple tests. Usually it's going to be done by the lab personnel at your place of manufacturing. And so one of the quick tests is to basically, the purpose of doing these is to gauge the quality of the milk coming into the plant. And so in order to look at aroma, we would want to have to warm up the milk. So here we're using, just for purposes of the demonstration, we're using pasteurized milk. Unfortunately, I don't have access to raw milk here at BCIT. It's not commercially sold, as you're well aware of. So the aroma profile is slightly different on pasteurized milk than it is on raw milk. So we're going to be working with two different samples. Sample A and B. And one of these samples has been temperature abused overnight. So we're going to see if we can detect any differences with the aroma between these two samples. And in order to detect the aroma, we need to heat the milk up. So usually it's heated to approximately 22 degrees, room temperature to get the profile. So if you're doing this as part of your job on a daily basis, you become really adept at this. So for me, this is not something that I've had formal training in where I do on a daily basis. So I'm not quite as attuned to the nuances but I do detect a slight difference in the aroma between these two samples. I'm going to see if we can back that up with some of our testing. So you'll notice in your handouts, we have a logbook. So this is on page 5-12. So it's entitled the Raw Milk Receiving Logbook. And we can be filling in this information as we go along. So we have two samples, sample A, sample B. So if we detect an aroma difference, we could be logging this. We could be logging the temperature of these samples. You'll notice that there's also deviation procedures. So there are specifications. For instance, the requirement for the temperature to be less than 4 degrees Celsius. So what happens if the milk comes in and it's above 4 degrees Celsius? Usually what happens is you're going to resample, you're going to take another sample to confirm that. Maybe you want to check your thermometer and verify that your thermometer that you're using is accurate and working properly. So if you resample it and the milk is still about 4 degrees Celsius, what do you do? So in that case, you'd be having to notify your supervisor. So whether it's the manager in the quality department or the production supervisor or plant manager, whoever the chain of command is within your situation is, you would have to be informing them what's going to be happening with that load of milk. So that's something that's being recorded in this logbook that we're filling out. So the next thing we're checking is what's known as pH. So we have a pH meter here. There are many different types of pH meters here. This happens to be an Acumet, but there's many, many different brands and types of pH meters. What's important to recognize is that you know how to use the pH meter properly and that you maintain it, which means looking after the electrode 
and also calibrating it with various standard buffers. So you see we have various color-coded solutions here that I purchased and these are standardized solutions pH 2, 4, 7 and 10 that I use to calibrate the pH meter. So I'm not going to walk through the actual calibration process in the interest of saving time but we have calibrated this meter. In essence the pH meter would be calibrated as a minimum once per day and oftentimes it's twice per shift and that would be documented in a logbook. So you would want to bracket the expected pH of your sample so you would choose typically the industry standard is pH 4 and pH 7 so it's a two-point calibration. Now in terms of looking after the electrode itself so different styles of electrode this has a fill solution in it so we want to make sure that the solution is inside the electrode that it's clean and it's ready to be used. To store the electrodes we store it in a commercial storage type of solution and that prolongs the life of the pH probe. So let's assume that our pH meter is calibrated, it was previously, so to actually perform the pH measurement I'll take sample A And generally what you do is you rinse the pH probe with clean distilled water and you blot it dry and you immerse the probe into your milk and every meter is a little bit different. Some will say ready, some will say okay. Right now this meter is saying stabilizing so it's waiting until it reaches a particular steady state or equilibrium and then I'll be able to record the result. So right now it says stable on the meter so my result here is 6.64 so when I'm finished with sample A I am going to rinse my probe the sheet that I'm filling out, there are specifications for pH. So this one says between 6.5 to 6.7. So we notice both our pHs are very similar values and they're indeed within the specifications. Now I want to point out that the specifications for pH and for TA are not regulated by the government these are standards or guidelines that each plant would determine it on its own. So there's no government regulation for pH or TA. What it does, it gives us a snapshot of the quality. So let's go to the next station which is titratable acidity. So there's a procedure for doing titratable acidity And this is on page 5.9, so it's titled Titratable Acidity. So we're just going to walk through the procedure here. So we're going to use our samples here that we're going to be using and measuring the pH. And we need to take a predetermined volume of milk. So we're looking to take 9 mils of milk. So using a uh, glass pipette. This one is actually calibrated to hold nine mils exactly. So I'm just filling it up to the meniscus. And you want to be as accurate as you can when you're doing this. And if you're doing this on a consistent basis, you'd be really good at being consistent and getting a very repeatable type of scale here. So I've got my nine mils of milk. I'm going to dispense it. And then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some distilled water. So it's asking us to put in about an equal amount of distilled water. Distilled water, the quantity doesn't have to be precise. It's not a critical amount. In fact, I'm just going to use the same pipette. 
The volume of the milk is what's critical, not the volume of uh, distilled water. Distilled water just uh, allows us to see things a little bit easier because we're going to be looking for a color change. So, just adding approximately nine mils of distilled water. Set that aside. So the next thing we need to do is we need to add an indicator. So we're looking for a color change. Hopefully you've had an opportunity in some previous life, perhaps in high school, or you've done a titration maybe in the chemistry lab, so maybe some of this will seem familiar to you. But we add a product called phenolphthalein. Just don't try and spell it. It's a, it's a big long word. And so this is just going to give us a color change. So just a few drops. Now we're going to titrate our sample. So I'll talk a little bit at, at the end about the difference between pH and TA, but let's for now just go straight through into the procedure. So I want to um, have my burette, which is this glass instrument that we see here, it's called a burette, and we fill it up with sodium hydroxide. It's a standardized solution. It's one-tenth normal, and that's filled into the burette. So, we want to see what volume we start at. So, sometimes these things are a little bit fussy to read. So, I'm going to suggest that we're starting at 0 0.1. So, I'll just record our starting volume. You put one mil. And now we're going to be adding the sodium hydroxide until we get a permanent light pink color. So I'm kind of going slowly here because I don't want to overshoot the mark. So a little bit at a time. And I'm looking for that pink color, which signifies the end point. So when you feel you're getting close, and it looks like I'm starting to have the end point right there. In fact, if I was to do a side-by-side -side comparison, sometimes it's hard to see, but if I was to put it on a white background, hopefully you're able to see the difference between the milk before and after. So this is my faint pink color. So at this point, I need to record the end volume. which is 1.8, I started with 0.1, so I've used a total of 1.7 mils. So, turning to the instructions, you will see in the calculation section at the bottom, you're looking at recording the volume of sodium hydroxide, which in this case is 1.7 milliliters, and we just simply divide by 10, and we're gonna record the value. So 1.7 divided by 10, is 0 0.17. So turning to our documentation page, which is the raw milk receiving, under TA for sample A, I get 0 0.17. Now you'll see the range is listed at 0 0.14 to 0 0.17. Again, just want to emphasize that these aren't regulatory standards set by the government. These are internal standards. So your facility may have numbers that are a little bit different. So let's talk about what pH and TA tells us. And what do the numbers mean? So we all know milk goes bad. That's why we pasteurize milk. So when you're pasteurizing milk, 
We're killing the pathogens or the disease-causing organisms through the process. But spoilage organisms will still remain. That's why milk is perishable and has a best before date. So the more that milk is tempted to abuse, the shorter the shelf life of the milk will be. If milk comes in with high numbers in terms of microorganisms or bacteria, then what we may find is even though the milk's pasteurized, we may have slightly elevated bacterial counts in the finished product. Again, nothing that's going to cause any foodborne illness or disease, but these are spoilage organisms. So the reason why it's important to monitor the temperatures, even of the raw milk, and do things like the aroma test is, we don't want to start with milk that's already at an elevated level of spoilage bacteria in the product. So, the two other tests that we've done is pH and titratable acidity. So, as bacteria build up in the finished product, what happens is they generate waste, just like you or I generate waste. We take food in and we go to the bathroom and our waste products um, are disposed of discreetly, I hope, through going to the bathroom is. Bacteria is the same thing. So their waste products that they produce, they're feasting off the sugars, the lactose in the milk. So there's plenty of food in the milk, the lactose, for those organisms to feast upon. And their waste products, as the bacteria grow and multiply, they produce waste products. And this waste products build up, then more acidity builds up in the milk. So really what we're looking at is the acidity levels in the milk. And these two tests, are two different ways to measure those acidity levels. So for pH, pH is on a scale from 0 to 14. So 0 is acidic, 14 is basic, and a pH of 7 is neutral. Most foods, in fact, 99% of foods have a pH below 7. There's only a couple of foods that I know of that have a pH above 7 soda crackers and egg whites but the majority of foods have a pH below 7 so as you saw with the milk we have a pH of 6.64 so that's the typical normal range for milk now if milk had a higher bacterial load and we measured the pH what would we expect would you expect that the pH would be higher or lower again a low pH means more acid. So if we think about this, if you have a lower pH, it signifies more acid, likely result of bacterial buildup. So the lower the pH, the more acidic it is and the more acid. Now we didn't distinguish much difference, 6.64 to 6.65. So it's a very small amount. Sometimes you'll find a bigger difference, but in this case, Sample A that had 6.64 was at a lower value, so perhaps there's a bit more organisms in sample A. So lower the pH number indicates more acid, means more bacteria. TA, on the other hand, is just the opposite. TA, I like to think of it as total acidity. Some people also refer to it as titratable acidity. Oftentimes ter terms are interchangeable, but Total acid, the higher the TA value, represents more bacteria in the product. So they're actually an opposite. So pH, a low pH value, is more bacteria, and a higher TA value, total acid, you're measuring the acid content, uh, equates to higher acidity levels. So all of this is documented on this. So Again, it depends on the specifications within your facility. So temperature, aroma, pH, and TA, these are a snapshot of some of the tests you may encounter. They may not all be done in your facility, so it may vary. Typically, if you get something that's out of specification, your internal specifications, you re repeat the test. And if it's still out of specifications, then you'd notify um, a supervisor or a manager about the deviation and so they can um, look further into that. 
The one test that I haven't talked about because we don't have the equipment here at BCIT is testing for antibiotics. So that's the charm test. So sometimes that may be done at your facility, sometimes it may be done upstream of your facility at the receiving uh, station, but that is the one test that can um, basically uh, refuse that load. So if you have a positive uh, result or you detect the presence of antibiotics in the milk, that is something that's regulated and that milk tanker load would be rejected. So these other tests are quality tests, but the antibiotic test is also um, a test that's performed and that is, um, would result in a rejected load. A couple more things before we finish off here. There is on page 5-2, there's a series of questions. So I'm gonna quickly go over them. So one of the questions is asking, why are we performing these types of tests? And I think I've summarized that. It's basically to ascertain what the quality level is in the milk. It gives you an idea of what to expect. So if you have more acidity measured by a TA or more acidity measured by a lower pH, you're starting to question, maybe there's something wrong with that load, maybe there's a higher bacterial buildup. So it also can impact things like shelf life. You know, if you start with a higher bacterial load, that's gonna affect your shelf life. Uh, another question relates to titratable acidity versus pH, the pros and cons of both. Hopefully you understand they measure different things. TA's total acid pH is measuring things differently. So they have pros and cons. pH obviously you need a pH meter, um, but it's very quick. It's easy to do. TA tests takes a little bit longer and is more skill required. Depending upon your milk, the, the composition is going to vary anyway, based on the breed of the cow, you know, the feed, the time of the year, you're going to find a range of pH and TA values. But regardless of which method that you're using, it's important to make sure that, uh, you know, these kind of tests are being considered and if there's problems that you can refer them to your supervisor.